Welcome to Automated Mobility, the people behind the wheel. In this podcast series, we get to know the experts working in the field of automated mobility. What drives them and how do they think their work contributes to a better mobility system? I am your host, Henriette Cornet, and I am the coordinator of SHOW, a European project testing automated vehicles in real life. SHOW is led by UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. Together with 70 other partners, we investigate a future where mobility is shared, connected and automated. Today's episode, Dominique Chalawa from Austria Tech. Hello, Dominique. Nice to have you uh, with us today. Thank you for having me, Henriette. Um, let me introduce you to the audience. Your name is Dominique Schallauer. You are Analyst Automated Mobility and Safety at Austria Tech. We will come back on that. Um, a word about Austria Tech, which I, what I could read, but you will tell us uh, more later. Austria Tech, it's a non-profit organization. It's a 100% subsidiary of the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate, Action, for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. Very long name. Uh, so you, you, you tell us more later. But first about your position, analyst for automated mobility and safety. What does it mean? And mostly analyst, what does it mean? I would say it means I try to analyze situations and find the right solutions to them. Wow. <laughs> it sounds ambitious. I try my best. Uh, basically, on the one hand, uh, we are directly working together with the federal ministry, as you mentioned, but we are also involved in different kind of national, but also EU projects like the award show. And uh, we are trying our best to, uh, yeah, basically innovate mobility. Okay. So, and when you say we, it's the entire uh, Austria Tech uh, colleagues mm -hmm. or your team or what What you mean with this innovation aspect? Right. I think the innovation aspect is what concerns all my colleagues at Austria Tech. So we are about 60 people working there and we all uh, work with different aspects of innovation and mobility. So it's through digitalization, automation and yeah, all those aspects come together in different kind of projects and yeah, we really, really try to drive uh, the mobility of the future, to say. Mm -hmm. Nice. So this sounds uh, exciting already when you say it like this. And your team is specifically working in automated mobility. Exactly. So you have this yeah. focus, yeah. Uh, but I get, I guess, interacting with the other, uh, other teams. Um, okay, I, I got it. So a quite ambitious uh, role, but also what does it mean in your daily life? So when... If you would try to explain a child <laughs> what you are doing, how would you formulate it? Uh, like you go to the office, what do you do? <laughs> a lot of tasks basically are managing. So it's a lot of communication. I think everyone will understand that it needs a lot of communication, a lot of meetings to bring things forward. And there is a lot of days where you have meetings from the morning till the evening. And but Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know about it. <laughs> But there's also other days where you really have the time to analyze situations, to, to make up a plan or to make up your mind on how to proceed and what's the best way to proceed. And I, I really like that mixture. Mm -hmm. That uh, sounds like a diversity of, uh, uh, of tasks there. I see. And um, how did you uh, end up doing that? So what is a bit your, your background, your, your, your story, so to say, that mm -hmm. you are now working in this field and also um, in this uh, exact position? I would say it was a coincidence, but uh -huh. a good coincidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, my background is I studied uh, at the University of Life Sciences in Vienna. So the bachelor and master's degree I did is called uh, environmental and bioresource management. Mm -hmm. And in it the master's sounds a bit uh, uh, yeah, it's away from automotive right, mobility, but right. you will tell us, okay? Uh, in the master, you have actually have the chance to f really focus on specific topics, and that's when I decided that I want to focus on transport and mobility. And that gave me a really broad picture about all different aspects, from traffic planning to psychology to even digital infrastructure. So it was quite interesting to see all those kind of aspects. And in the end, one of the lecturers actually is a colleague now at Ostertech. So that's when I got aware of the company and applied there. And basically that's the story. <laughs> ah, okay. So directly from the university right. 
to Austria Tech. I'll yep. see. I see, I see. Let's move now to show and that you can tell us a bit what is the role of Austria Tech in the project and later maybe more specifically your role because you have other colleagues also working in the project. Um, so wait, and tell us what is your contribution. But let's start with Austria Tech in general and the role in show. Austria Tech in general. So uh, as already mentioned, our team is focused on automated mobility and safety. So on the one hand, we are the national contact point in Austria for everything that happens around automated mobility. If it's testing and the companies or the institutes who want to test, they come to us. But we are also involved in projects like show. And there we are, of course, interested in the legal developments uh, on a European level, on a even international level, because we want to use that learnings uh, to really bring forward the Austrian law, to, to say it like that. And that's why we are also leading the work package on that in show. And we also have like the practical examples in Austria, because we are also leading the Austrian, it is called Megasite in the event. I think the, the, the listeners are already familiar with the term. Mm -hmm. no? <laughs> a bit, they should, they should, because we have introduced it. And I will make a link, uh, just for you to know, I will make a link in the description of the episode to the website where you can find this mega site mm -hmm. description. Great. So yeah, basically we have three, three local sites in Austria, which are in Graz, Carinthia and Salzburg. And they all cover different kind of mobility aspects, but in the end they all deploy fleets of shared automated vehicles And yeah, we hope that really users will will love it. Will love that because now we really really come to the phase where vehicles are deployed and they will be a part of the life of the citizens in that specific area. And it's really will be really interesting to see uh, how this will how this will work out in the end. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the, the different sites? Meaning, I think what would be interesting for the audience to know is. Uh, uh, you mentioned automated vehicles, so which type of vehicles are deployed? And examples, may, uh, you, you can decide on the level of details, but example of, uh, of really services, so to say, so which type of uh, mobility services you will uh, cover with these shuttles and uh, maybe also which, um, quest which uh, research questions mm -hmm. you have, like you would like to find out, having uh, all these people testing your, your, um, your vehicles. So I think the interesting thing now with our three sites is that we really have different regions in Austria involved. So for example, in Salzburg, we have a more peri-urban area, you could say, that we connect to the city center of Salzburg. So it's really meant for, for example, commuters uh, who live in the village and want to go to work or for, for shopping or something else to the city center of Salzburg. And there we really cover the last mile, like from the... Uh, public transport service, that is a regular line operation, to the village uh, by automated shuttle, which will go there in the end on demand. And it's really should be something that should enable the citizens there to really not have to use any private cars anymore. Mm -hmm. And you say on demand, it means they can book the ride through a um, appli smartphone application or, or whatever. How will it be done, this on-demand aspect? Right, that is the plan. Uh, there's also additional services planned. So in the end, um, you could even enhance those services by already, for example, predicting the demand. You know, one person is going to work every day from the village to Salzburg. Mm -hmm. And you specifically know that. And you can already prepare everything for that so that the ride is really com comfortable for him, for example, the vehicle is right waiting at the right time and mm -hmm. yeah so also s such aspe aspects may be really important for users to really enjoy or to really see the benefit of such services okay so meaning the the users or the, the citizen will register somewhere saying every day i'm traveling from there to there and i would like to have such a service something like that yes based on that but it is also based on learning algorithms so For example, there's a specific uh, task on that to really have um, in place uh, a system 
which will dynamically adapt to the demand, just to say it like that. Okay, but how will, will you gather the data from the demand? So where will this data come of from? Of course, you need some data from the beginning to learn from the data. You can't make yeah, up the data yeah, 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 that's because, right. yeah, it's Is based it coming on from the systems. current public transport system that you get the data from there, from existing uh, data from the public transport system? Right, the public transport okay. operator is involved okay. there, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And gives you already the... the The so travel demand, so to say. For example, uh, yes, okay. yes. I see, cool, nice, yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds important, really. So that's something we mention also at uh, UITP quite often when we talk about automated mobility, um, this accessibility in terms of how do people in a peri-urban area or rural area can access mobility systems and uh, public transport, of course, when it's a uh, metro and so on, you can't cover... Uh, an entire area, so and it, it gets more complicated in uh, urban areas. So that could be a, a nice solution. It's good. It's great that you are testing it there. Any other service you want to mention? Or um, in the project, we call it also use cases. They are not exactly the same, but it may be too um, too specific. But like which type of usage uh, usages are, are thought in Austria beyond this uh, peri-urban uh, aspect? One I think really interesting use case is. Um, the use of one vehicle for, on the one hand, transporting passengers, but also cargo. So it's cargo not... Cargo meaning... Uh, cargo parcels. meaning small parcels, for example, mm -hmm. or in the specific case in Klagenfurt, uh, for example, we will also involve the pharmacy there, uh, and it is planned that, for example, um, some medical supplies or stuff from the pharmacy gets picked up by the shuttle because it's... Uh, it's already on the route of the shuttle and brings it, for example, to the Lakeside Park, which is a business park with many employees. And if they need something to order, they can order it from the shuttle. And it's not that there is an additional vehicle necessary to cover that ride because the shuttle is already driving there. So it's more about the combination of that services. Uh, so you mean a place in the shuttle will be dedicated right. for uh, parcels? Okay. Right. And then there will be like a pickup station where... Uh, the shuttle can drop off the supplies and it can be picked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, sounds quite, uh, also quite useful, I guess, for like, the employees that don't have, that, uh, who do not have time uh, to go to the pharmacy, as you said. Okay, great. Looking forward to see it uh, <laughs> running <laughs> and everything. Um, how far are you um, now? Um, so, yeah, we are in different, the three sides are in different stages of deployment, we can say, because they have different time horizons. And there have been many challenges that have to, yeah, that we had to overcome until now. And now the site in Carinthia that I mentioned, which also involves the, the site of Klagenfurt, um, they already have a lot of experience and they already had a deployment at one site in Carinthia. So they are building up on that to, to bring new things into show. So they already uh, had um, uh, a pre-demo, which is like a run without real passengers. So they already dis did that in Perchach at in, in Carinthia. We will put the name in the description <laughs> yeah. of the episode, I think. That's <laughs> For some people, it's it's a bit <laughs> hard to... Uh, yeah. No, it, it's uh, both 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 of that villages actually or cities are at the Lake of Wörthersee, which is a really nice lake in mm -hmm, Carinthia, I and confirm. I could advise anyone to go there someday. <laughs> it's a really nice area of Austria, and of course, take the shuttle for the last mile. Yeah, and uh, and try uh, try the service. Yeah, and the other sites will follow a bit later, right? Right. So uh, in Salzburg, actually, um, we now have a, a very interesting solution because there is now an electric uh, minivan being set up for operations. Now, this is really happening right now, and we will start operations later this year. And in Graz, basically, um, the vehicles are already ready to perform the services. So they are ready to start, or at least one vehicle is now ready to start. And we were a bit blocked by the legal situation, mm -hmm. uh, but that now also finally has resolved by last week. And we were able um, to now have an amendment of the Austrian legal framework for automated driving, which now also enables the new use case in Graz, even with higher speeds than it was allowed. Until okay, let, let's give the legislative framework for, for <laughs> just uh, just uh, afterwards. Okay. But uh, to focus, to come back again on the Graz uh, side, there, um, if I remember correctly, you are using... Um, private, private cars. I mean, you norm, normal, usual cars, right, yeah. retrofitted mm -hmm. to be auto uh, automated, 
And uh, so what is the service there to be provided? Exactly. I wouldn't say it's private cars because the purpose is that really exactly. those those cars are then shared. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the people to visualize yep. in a man, it's like, they look like a normal car. Yeah, it's like yeah. a Ford, for example, yeah. Ford Mondeo that everyone probably knows, but it's really outfitted to perform uh, a service between a public transport terminal and the shopping center. So there is already buses going there, but like the interval is not that tight because it's at, a peri or it's at, the, at the border of the city, basically. It's a commercial area. Right, yeah. Like a, yeah, yeah. It's, and uh, so the, the service there will be to really pick up the passengers from the public transport terminal where also the tram line ends and bring them to the shopping center or even more attractive, I guess, bring them back because if you bought something at Ikea, for example, You can put it in the trunk and, and drive back. Yeah. Mm -hmm, cool. And this will be also like uh, you order it a bit like you would uh, call a cab or is it something that will um, run? Uh, right. Like, yeah. uh, like, uh... Actually, um, there will be two vehicles running there. So they are going both sides mm -hmm. and they will wait at the station. And if a passenger comes, he can just get on and get to the other side. The ride just takes a few minutes and then it's available for the next passenger already again. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Is there anything else you want to add about the sites in uh, uh, in Austria? Uh, yes, maybe one question that I have is, what is different in Austria in comparison with the other sites? Because uh, mm -hmm. for the audience in show, we have many countries involved and uh, you have heard already, already in the previous episodes, the one uh, in, in Finland, the one in Germany. So what is special in, uh, in, in Austria? So, of course, when you mention Finland... We don't have that much snow and that cold temperatures than in Finland, but it can also be a challenge in Austria, actually, in winter, especially at the Salzburg site, for example. I think what is also special is that we have quite touristic areas, for example, at Wörthersee, where there's really many hotels, for example, and tourists arriving there, also big events taking place there. And this is one interesting case, I think. And there's also, but I think that this is the case in, in many other countries, especially uh, in peri-urban areas, the dependence of the private car. Uh, and we really try um, to really incentivize or to, to have systems that are that good that people are not really um, dependent, yeah, dependent yeah. on the private yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's also for us in, uh, at UITP something very important that people that cannot afford a car, mm. people that cannot drive anymore because uh, for some, I don't know, for some reason they don't have a, or they don't have at all a driving license uh, and so on, they can still move, they have still access to mobility. So. But I, myself, uh, I grew up in a, in a, a, a very uh, rural area, to say, in Upper Austria. And especially, like you mentioned, children, teenagers or elderly people, they depend on someone to drive them. Yeah, and I, I, the parents are playing the taxi right, like all right. the time. <laughs> and I think it would be really great. Uh, and I think uh, there is a really great uh, possibility that automated vehicle can be a game changer there because the regular public transport services um, that run on line-based are really expensive to maintain and um, they don't cover the mobility needs of all people there because like, yeah, There's houses everywhere and you cannot send a public bus everywhere. So I think there's really great potential for, for automated mobility. Mm, okay, let's. Uh, I would like now to hear more about uh, the legislative framework because it's also a specific task that you have uh, in the project. So beyond being the coordinator of the Austrian mega site, Austria Tech is also coordinating all the discussions around a legislative framework for uh, automated mobility and you mention it already that something happened last week that you were mm. waiting for a long time but maybe before coming to that can you um, can you draw kind of an overview for the audience to understand what are the challenges with this le uh, legislative framework I think here it's really important to clarify what especially we are talking about because on the one hand we have like test and trail scenarios which have taken place for a few years now in several countries. So there was specific legislation made for that. And then we have the big challenge when we think about transferring that trail and test operations to real-life operation. We need totally different legal frameworks, which are way more standardized, I would say, and uh, will enable like the, the big scale-up, to say it like that. Okay, so one, one operator now, uh, before putting a vehicle on the road, 
e an AV on the road, you would have to say, is it for testing and just a limited time frame? Mm, or mm. do I want to make my mm. uh, public transport operation with it? Right, and the But latter... Both are, both are possible, right? The latter is not actually possible in most countries right now. Mm -hmm. But the first one, uh, regarding the first one, we did a really in-depth analysis because this has been, uh, yeah, as mentioned, considered for several years now. So like five, six, seven years, I would say many countries have recognized that automated mobility has some advantages and we need to investigate how to best make use of it. And that was when dedicated action plans was, for example, brought into place and specific legal frameworks were brought into place to enable the testing of automated mobility systems. And that's when also big operators first started to really apply for such uh, test permits and then try it in real life. And I have, we have really analyzed uh, those test frameworks in depth. And I must say, there's so many different um, Yeah, different perspectives that national authorities were taking when they put them into place because they wanted to enable something and then they had to find a balance between, okay, we will enable testing, but we have to find the right requirements, for example, to make sure it's safe. Yeah, so safety is the most important thing mm -hmm. uh, there, right? So that's the biggest concern mm -hmm. is that uh, the testing stay safe. Right, yeah, and there's a lot of measures put into place uh, to to make that to make that possible to, to make safe testing possible, and it's interesting to really analyze the the different perspectives that were taken because in some countries I would say it's it's more based on kind of trust. So <laughs> entity, entities that want to test and authorities they they communicate a lot about the the test case, for example, and you have a lot of freedom. Uh, as long as as the trust is there, I would say. But in other countries, there's very specific, um, for example, specific test or scenarios that have to be tested beforehand, or there's even site acceptance tests so that the authorities come to your site and see, okay, it's driving now, it's turning it's left, it's, it's yeah. stopping. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so there's very different What uh, number of approaches. kilometers to be traveled before, things like yeah, that? Yeah, no? actually we had that requirement in Austria, uh -huh. uh, but... We had the requirement that there have to be a, a, a number of kilometers traveled or tested beforehand on private proving grounds and in simulation. Actually, now uh, we don't have that requirement anymore because we have uh, now switched to a different uh, scheme, I would say. Mm -hmm. So should we <laughs> move to this part? Meaning, do you want to see a bit how it was before and how this uh, amendment, what, what was the change of this amendment and... Mm. How is it better? Because I understood that you were quite happy about this amendment, so it seems like it's making your life easier. Right, yeah. Especially from the perspective of the show project, we were really waiting for this amendment to happen. Uh, actually, uh, the first uh, ordinance for automated driving was introduced in 2016 in Austria. And back then, uh, there was a really unique approach, I would say, to only allow specific use cases to be tested. So the ministry said, okay, there's this very specific use case where we think they are very useful. For, it was the automated minibus at that time, uh, the automated highway pilot with lane changing, and the automated military vehicle. Uh, and yeah, it was possible to apply for those three use cases basically and the requirements as already mentioned were for example that you that the vehicle was already tested before for a few thousand kilometers at private proving grounds and there were a few other requirements but basically that was it and now uh, of course through projects like show or other european projects there was a demand uh, to have additional use cases Because, as you already mentioned, for example, at the Graz side, we are not using automated minibuses, we are, but we are using conventional cars that are upgraded to automated vehicles. And those kind of vehicles, they have already been type approved before, so they already fulfilled specific standards, for example, in active or passive safety, which means that the passenger... Um, there is some level of safety guarantee for the passenger as in compared to total prototypes. Okay, active and passive safety, can you define them quickly, if it's possible, for the audience who is not familiar with, the, with these terms? 
passive safety basically means all um, the how the car is designed so the passenger is safe. So it's really about how um, the things are positioned. So in a traditional car, it's for example, the steering wheel, how it's positioned in front of you in case of an accident um, so that you don't get hurt basically um, by, the, by the car itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and active, uh, active safety is all the systems that are involved to avoid dangerous situations. So it would, for example, also be systems like ABS for safe braking, uh, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the new amendment, uh, we now have the possibility uh, with a dedicated use case uh, to also have cars that are based on previously type-approved vehicles. And that's why we even allow now a higher speeds. So for the automated minibuses, they had really low average speed usually. Uh, but um, now, since uh, this is made possible, we can also go higher speeds at the Graz side in show, uh, yeah. Yeah, at specific yes, uh, parts of the route. Um, that's also something I wanted to ask and referring to the um, uh, a report that you have worked on, uh, deliverables, so it's called like this in the uh, European uh, funded projects, that I will put the link where you um, made an overview of all the legal framework in, uh, frameworks in Europe, very interesting document. Um, and I noticed that for some countries there is the speed limit applied mm. to mm. the to the automated vehicle. Is there a speed limit now or is it just higher? There is a new speed limit, actually, yeah. Uh, and for that specific use case that I mentioned before, it is now up is up to 50 kilometers an mm -hmm. hour. So I think it's quite good for urban scenarios. If you have like a dedicated lane, for example, like we have in Graz, you can really try to go a bit faster there. But it is, of course... Um, connected to requirements. So it's not that everyone can drive now 50 kilometers in his tests, but you have to before really analyze, analyze the route uh, in depth. So you really need to um, have a look at every section of the route that you are planning to test on and analyze if there's any risks. So we really have a criteria catalog now, um, which the applicants have to use and they go on site there, for example, in Graz. And they think for every segment of the route, okay, there is this situation, there's this intersection, what risks are there? And based on that risk analysis of the route, then you have to decide, for example, for a speed that is safe there. Mm -hmm. And is it, this is to be done alone by the applicant or mm -hmm. is it to be done together with the uh, authorizing uh, um, entity? So actually, yes, the applicant has to submit that with his application, final, but... We at Austria Tech are the contact point for automated mobility in Austria and we are supporting applicants in that. So really, if there's any questions, we are in contact with the applicants and we really have a constant exchange to prepare basically all the necessary documents together with them to finally submit them to the ministry then. Okay, but great. So it means like if any uh, anyone in Austria is listening to us now and they want to, someone wants to deploy a service with uh, AVs, they should right. get in touch yep. with you and Definitely. you can help and uh, make their life easier in terms of uh, for sure. getting a permit uh, for the for, for the service. Okay, cool. Um, and I don't know if you want to add something about this amendment. Otherwise, I would have question to go also outside a bit of Austria to look at other frameworks. But mm. uh, do you have anything to add for this uh, amendment particularly? Maybe something new that is not existing in other any um, legal framework uh, in Europe or even worldwide. Is there something very uh, special in this uh, new amendment? Actually, that risk analysis of the route that I just mentioned, I think is quite a unique approach now. Um, so um, we have, I have already mentioned that authorities all over Europe or all over the world find creative requirements, I would say, to make it safe. And we think now that this is a good approach uh, to really have an in-depth look at the route. And actually, this method is based on the road safety inspection method. So basically, this is a method that is mandatory for all European member states, basically, for the higher ranking road network. But we use that method to bring it to the urban roads, for example, or villages, uh, to also use it to analyze the infrastructure there. And I think it's really important to do it like that because the automated vehicles that we see nowadays, they are designed for very specific use cases and they have very specific capabilities, but also very specific limitations. And you really need to compare if 
the capabilities and limitations of that AV fit to your specific site. Mm -hmm. And that's what that method allows now. Okay. And this risk assessment is in, in form of a checklist? Right, you can you can call it a checklist. Actually, it starts with a checklist where you analyze specific places uh, along your route. For example, if there's schools, if there's accident hotspots, it's really important to know that, so you 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 know how to, yeah, how to mitigate risks there. And then after that initial, I would say, analysis of the route, uh, you start with the segmentation. So you say, okay, here's that intersection. Here's a roundabout. Here I want to put a bus stop. And you really make individual segments. Mm -hmm. And then you also have a checklist again with criteria. For example, how is the visibility there? Or how is the road markings there? And we have defined like specific um, ratings for that. So in the end, you can come up with the risk potential for every segment of the route. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if the risk is too high at certain part of the routes, you have to think about how to mitigate the risks there. Yep. Yeah, so there is a learning process also right. within the application, so to right. say. That, uh... And in the end, the ministry and also the, the experts who evaluate the... the The application? Yeah. The application, right. Um, they want to see uh, what measures have been taken to ensure safety. Okay. So you can take infrastructural measures, for example. You can, if the road markings are bad, you can make them new. You can make, you can renew them, for example. Okay, so it's not like a one shot. You send your application and it's rejected or not. It can yeah. be like a, a accompanying process, right. like a really that uh, to facilitate the deployment right. of uh, of uh, EVs. Okay, yep. was Austria Tech involved in this amendment in this change of uh, regulation? Yeah, we are working very closely with the ministry on that. And basically, we, we were also uh, gathering the demand for amendment. So mm -hmm. it's a dynamic process, I would say. With the first regulation, only specific use cases were allowed. And now Austriatech was in the role of collecting uh, what should be amended, basically. And we gathered that input for new use cases and... In the end, uh, we now finally have the amendment ready, which really fits to the needs of the of the stakeholders who want to test in Austria. Mm -hmm. That sounds great, meaning I have the impression, looking at your role also now in the show project, which is not only looking at Austria, but at all these countries, and it's a European-funded uh, project, you will do a similar job, so to say, at European level, right? You will be with all this gathering of um, of uh, different uh, legislative framework from different countries, you would be able to provide recommendations for the local uh, authorities, correct? We are right now working on that really intensively. <laughs> uh, and the goal here is also to have recommendations to come from test and trailing to real-life operation. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have pilots running for a specific time, even if it's a longer period. But when the real deployment will start, we, we need a different legal framework. And that's why we are um, developing recommendations at the moment involving the local level, the regional level, the national level, the European level, but also the international level. So and it's really important uh, to consider what, what should be regulated at what level Because in the end, we have seen it with some other new mobility services. There shouldn't be the case, for example, in cities. Um, I, I was thinking about shared bikes, for example. There was the situation a few years ago um, that there was just uh, too many of them, basically. And there was less users that used them. So they, they were just laying unused everywhere and they yeah, created they a lot everywhere. of chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with automated mobility, we shouldn't end in the situation that cities have to react to a situation like that. We should have the right rules in place on a national so level, anticipate. on a European level beforehand, so we so we have everything anticipated beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And um, what I could see also in the very uh, interesting report on the, with the overview of all the current legislation for automated vehicles. What about the safety driver? Um, is it so uh, some countries now can drive without safety driver? And uh, what's, uh, what's your view on that? What is uh, the case in Austria? And uh, what can we hope for the future? Because 
um, maybe we can remind and you can also elaborate on that one of the motivation for the public transport um, operators to go towards automated mobility. So, of course, we have the topic of safety, of uh, reducing emissions and uh, um, making the traffic more uh, more fluid and so on. But there is also this cost aspect that is very important for, for operators and for uh, local authorities because for now, unfortunately, um, the cost of uh, that are linked with bus drivers are very, very high and that's what's making public transport sometimes uh, a bit sparse, sparse. And we have heard this in the um, opening episode from uh, André Engelvik mentioning it. If we manage to reduce the cost, having no safety driver on board, it will enable also to have better service to put the, the money that uh, is saved into in, uh, improving the service somewhere else. So at the end, right. that's, an idea. that's not for profit, but that's really for making the service better somewhere else. So that was just an introduction for this topic of why we should be able to not having this human person inside the vehicle. And my question now, is it allowed uh, now in, uh, in some countries? I, I think so. I've heard in some countries they, uh, they have um, enabled it. And uh, what's, what's your view on that? So actually, I think it's also important here, again, to distinguish between trail operations and going to real life operations. Now, when it comes to trail operations, we know that in some countries uh, it is actually possible to also test without safety driver. Although we also know that some testing entities, also project partners, st still decide to use a safety driver because during trail operations it's always good to have a backup in place. Although he may never intervene at all, it's still a good thing, I guess. And of course, as you mentioned, when we shift to real life operations, it will be totally different kind of of drivers needed. It's not drivers anymore, but it could be operators who monitor several kinds of people and it will be very specific new roles that they have to fulfill there. Mm -hmm. Outside the right, vehicle, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from a teleoperation um, system like control tower. Right, um, that there needs always to be some humans in the background. Mm -hmm. For example, if you think about emergency situations, we have seen that in, in many previous projects that it's very important for passengers that they always have the possibility to contact a person. So they do not want to talk to a chatbot or something like yes, that yes, on yes. the vehicle. I they, know the yeah. feeling when I'm calling my bank or something, <laughs> I just want to talk to a real person. And I guess it right. will be the same with right. mobi some mobility situations. Yeah. So we need to consider that. And when it comes to real life operations, actually um, the forerunners, I would say, like it was in this case Germany and France already have introduced legal frameworks that enable the real operation of automated, fully, fully automated uh, services. But it is still unclear uh, how the setup of operational areas will work in reality. So this is still some time to go until we're really there that it, that becomes operational. And how is it in uh, Austria now with this new uh, amendment? Actually, with the new amendment for, for testing, the safety driver is still in a very important role for us because the risk analysis that I mentioned before is in close, uh, close rela relation to that, I would say. So if you unveil some risks there and you need to mitigate them, and those risks aren't risks that you can mitigate by improving technology, for example, or by improving the infrastructure because it's just not, yeah, not convenient or not, not really a, th a thing to do to build a new roundabout or something like that. Then it's very good that you have a, a safety driver on board and somehow you can, now with the new amendment, there's also the necessity to really give a dedicated briefing to the safety drivers. Okay, at that position of the route, you really need to check, check for that risk. And if everything goes fine, the automated vehicle is, a is able to drive there anyway. But you need to really take care of that risk because we are still in a technical development yep. phase. And, uh, and investigating a and, and right, uh, learning yeah. and so on. So for the, for the testing, uh, it's from a, what I understand from your point of view, we should keep the safety driver as someone that monitors the, the test, the, right. the experience, so to say. But of course, later we we need to remove uh, to remove the safety driver for for cost reason to use the money differently. Let's say like that, and for that we will need the legal uh, framework for for enabling this. We were mentioning, so you were also mentioning that uh, you observe what happened at international, European level, na um, national level, and so on. And it goes 
you mentioned the lender in Germany, but also I guess some cities may have also some specific um, framework rules for themselves. Can we hope someday that there will be harmonization and that we will not have this granularity of mm. uh, requirements depending on the on the level? So I think we are in a, in a very important phase right now because in some cases, for some use cases, we are in the phase of the transitional from testing to real life operation. And now we finally have the chance to harmonize because before for testing and trailing, basically every country came up with their own um, method how to enable that. But now we need standardized procedures to really proceed. Of course, there have been, as mentioned, some countries who have been the foreigners to drive it, like Germany and France, but there is also a European framework in preparation for that. So, mm -hmm. And we are very closely linked to that with our recommendations in the project, where we're really trying to find common common things, common basically a common procedure. Of course, there will always be national specifics or the room for national specifics, like it was before for public transport services, for example. There is some national specifics. But there should be a yeah, a guideline, a guideline, kind yeah. of a guideline right. uh, for all these uh, aspects. And yes, that's, that's good that you emphasize this, and it shows also like the importance of the project and that the project will have impact. So with all this um, experimentation, all these tests that we are doing, and on the different levels, so we have talked already on this podcast on some technical layers to be to be solved. But this. Uh, regulation aspects is a legal framework. Um, I can really see as a coordinator that the work that you are doing in collaboration with uh, many partners in the project will influence future legal framework in your, at least at European level, but I'm sure also because we are talking to uh, Japanese colleagues, to Korean colleagues, to uh, US, to other countries, uh, we, are, uh, we will also influence them uh, with our uh, progress towards this uh, harmonization and recommendations for harmonizations, at least. So, yeah. I hope so, yes. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to advertise from uh, what, uh, what uh, you, you are doing, what Austria Tech is doing, what is happening in the show project that you would like to put some light on? I think we are now in the face of the project uh, that we are really beginning to see this year the real operation of our services in our sites. Yeah, and I would really like to invite everyone uh, to visit us, to visit all our sites. They are in different areas of Austria. They are all very beautiful, I must say. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful country. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this I would like to advertise because there you can really... and. Uh, feel for yourself how it feels uh, to be part of such a mobility system. At some sites, for example, in Carinthia, there will be a fleet of, in the end, three, four shuttles deployed, and it can really make the impression that you're, uh, this is becoming reality. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, way to, to end this episode, to invite all uh, our listeners now to, uh, to check out uh, when the... When this, uh, so they, we will have demo events happening there, but they can also get in touch with you, I would say, and uh, and to get to know uh, when uh, when would be this, uh, uh, when can they have a ride with the AV. There are information on the show website, which is also in the description of the episode. And if for the people listening to us in uh, many years from now, I'm sure we will have many a lot of learnings, a lot of findings that will uh, still be interesting to to check. Um, so yeah, go to the go sure, to the yeah. website and, and and check out. Thanks a lot, Dominique, for this very interesting uh, exchange, and um, we keep in touch, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harriet. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Automating Mobility, the people behind the wheel. This podcast would not have been possible without the support from the Horizon 2020 program by the European Commission under the Grant Agreement Number 875530. Check out the links for the show project and other references in the description of the episode and subscribe to our newsletter to stay tuned. Don't hesitate to share this episode or give us feedback to it. My name is Henriette Cornet from UITP and I hope to see you at our next episode.